Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Eliman Avni, Assistant Professor of Piano at SUNY Fredonia. Um, this conversation you're about to see is part of the Robert Jordan Piano Festival. Um, and our theme for this year is self-care for musicians. I'm, I'm honored that Dr. Elaine Aaron has agreed to have this conversation with me. Uh, she's the author of The Highly Sensitive Person. This book sold over a million copies, translated to 14 different languages. Uh, groundbreaking um, for its content and its ideas. Um, she's also the author of The Undervalued Self, another fabulous book. Um, the way that the conversation unfolded, we really jumped right in and we started bouncing off ideas um, that are and discussing ideas presented in the books. And I thought it would be smart for me to just give you a little bit of a, a background and, and, and maybe describe the terminology a little bit in more detail for those of you who have not read the books. So first of all, an HSP is somebody who is highly sensitive. Uh, 20 to 30% of the, the population are considered highly sensitive. There is some research suggesting that there's a genetic component to it, um, that there's you know, different hormones operating in the brain um, for, for highly sensitive people. And of course, there are the non-HSP, uh, the not highly sensitive people, which make the 80% of the population. Um, I want to make it clear that there is no value judgment attached to either of those groups. It's a little bit like some people being tall and some people being short. It is what it is. But I think what, what helps us in this conversation you're about to hear is to see how highly sensitive people um, may be more um, sensitive to the environment around them, especially on stage. Uh, the other, oh yeah, I want to mention that if you want to check and see if you are a highly sensitive person, you can go on Elaine's site, which is hsperson.com, and there's a test there that you can take. It will take you about two minutes, and you can ascertain if you're highly sensitive or not. Um, the other set of terminology is um, the ideas of linking and ranking, which um, she discusses in The Undervalued Self. Linking is our ability to connect to another human being, our parents, our siblings, our family, our colleagues, our friends. Uh, it's about the connection that we make with other people, to our music, to instruments, etc. Ranking is us putting these things in relationship to one another in a hierarchy. We have our boss, the secretary, the associate vice president, and so on and so forth. Everybody gets a rank and everybody's put in relationship to, um, to other components. Both linking and ranking are essential to our survival. Uh, they developed as part of our... Um, survival uh, tactics. What's important to, again, to note is that both of them are working together. One is not better than the other, and we just have to find the balance in between them. The reason why I'm bringing all of this forward is because I think you'll see in the conversation that we use both the terminology of the HSPs and the terminologies of linking and ranking to describe what happens to artists on stage and how um, performance anxiety, or as we refer to it, MPA, musicians performance anxiety, uh, can benefit from these, these new paradigms um, and perspectives. I think this was enough. Uh, if there are any questions, please um, send me emails. I'll be happy to answer them uh, for you or leave a link, leave a, uh, a comment below. And without further ado, um, this is Dr. Elaine Aaron and our conversation. Thank you. The, the question is, do we think that all artists are HSPs? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. I think the stereotype would probably be so. But then there's the problem for artists now, more than in the past, of getting themselves seen and heard. And that often requires a lot of aggression in order, in order to move up in what, what we've been talking about, about ranking. The, the ranking in our society is everywhere. I mean, in animals, you see ranking and linking. It's not, there's nothing wrong exactly with ranking but every artist knows where they are in, in their profession's rank. And that can be hard on highly sensitive people. I'll give you an example. I had a person come to me for a consultation who was an Olympic ready athlete and she could do what her, I can't, I, I won't go into what it was that she was doing because this is confidential in that sense, but she could, could equal Olympic records when she was by herself or in a small meet. But when she got to the Olympic 
trials. She couldn't. And we, then her coach wanted her to figure out what she could do about this high sensitivity thing, which they'd figured out. I said, well, you know, and I, and I gave her the tips that we'll go into, but you have to realize the Olympics are about the best athletes under a high degree of pressure, not the best athletes. Right. It's a big difference. And of course, Sparta wanted its warriors to be able to do what they were doing in battle, not just to be watched, but it's a, it's a big problem for sensitive people to perform at their best uh, uh, under pressure, the same kind of pressure that s some people will thrive on pressure and perform better. Right. And, and they're really, we'll talk, we'll talk soon about high sensitivity because they're, the anxiety, uh, there's sort of one of the great rules of psychology is that you don't perform well when you're over, overstimulated or understimulated. If you're bored, you know, you, you're not going to perform very well. And if you're too, too amped up uh, to the point where you, your heart is pounding, you know, your mind isn't very clear. And so some people really do, don't get to that overstimulated edge very easily. They, they love to perform and they don't perform well without an audience. And then sensitive people are more at the other end. So what is a highly sensitive person? Well, I've been researching this for about probably almost 30 years now. And we know very well, uh, we know that it's found in over a hundred species. It's a survival trait, basically, of paying attention more. And you might think, well, everybody needs to pay attention, but actually there are times when you don't need to pay attention and you sensitive people are paying more attention than they should. Uh, and the, uh, the more interesting rule is that it's negative frequency dependent, which means that if there's too many people who are highly sensitive, it's, the trait's going to disappear because there's no benefit to it. It has to be a minority. Uh, I tell the story that I, I um, know some shortcuts that even, even Google Maps doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> A few. I'm not even going to say where they are or <laughs> refer to them. But if if you studied your maps carefully and studied your roads carefully, you can get places that other people can't. But if everybody knew those, then it's not a shortcut anymore. So if everybody were sensitive, there'd be no point of being sensitive. So it's not that we're weaker or, or something. It's, it's that we have a kind of a superpower that can be uh, that if everybody had it, be no point. And they have computer simulations of this and animals and how good the grass is, whether um, how important it is for this animal to study the grass and know that this is the better grass than that grass. Sometimes it's not enough different, sometimes it is. So we talk about HSPs, highly sensitive people with, with four, um, by the way, there's just as many women as men who are highly sensitive, and some are extroverts, so it's not the same as introversion. But we talk about uh, the trait with, with four letters, D-O-E-S, uh, and depth of processing is the most important one in this thing about noticing details. Overstimulation is the second one. It's the only negative, but that's the problem, is that we do get overstimulated, overaroused in, in certain situations. E is for empathy and emotional responsiveness. So we're very responsive to the music, responsive to the audience, which is of course, absolutely essential to an artist. And then sensitive to subtle details, which again, is very important for an artist and uh, also for survival. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe we we'll should talk in terms of non ages speak and people who are, who are, are not in this, um, in this group of I, I was 20% of the population, I believe. 20, 20, possibly 30%. It's a little bit hard to be sure. And I hate to call them non HSPs, although I do sometimes. They're people without the trait, but it doesn't mean that they're not sensitive right. people in other ways. Right. So, so how would you, if we took two musicians, one in, in HSP and one not HSP, um, and we go, <laughs> so we would say that we would say what? I'm going to laugh because I, I've already done this with you right. at, on YouTube. On YouTube, There's you and there's Lang Lang playing the part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so different. 
and fun to watch. You know, he's fun to watch. It makes you laugh, but you're so different. And I think the approach, I mean, I, I don't, I, not that familiar with music, but there's also the sense while you're watching someone, how much they've gone inside with the music and that what's coming out has gone through this inner process versus someone who is playing more for the audience or very aware of the audience. And then there's somebody, you know, I only know stereotypes, kind of Yo-Yo Ma, who seems to go in and out, in and out, where he's in there and then he's very connected with the audience. But of course, if you're doing a YouTube or something, you probably do have to pay more attention. I don't know, but, and then there's that introversion, extroversion thing, which is not the same thing. Then in terms of, if you know them a little better, the thing that sensitive people, they can be high sensation seekers even. They may love to go on tour and all that, but they do get overstimulated. And the more important thing is the difference between the sensitive person and the person who's less sensitive is impulsivity. So I would, I would imagine that a, the less sensitive um, musician would take more risks uh, on stage and maybe in terms of the kinds of venues that they went to, the kinds of performances. Uh, and I think that they would not need to do the things that we're gonna go through some tips for people who, not all highly sensitive people have performance anxiety and certainly, and we want, this is, we want to be able to include all the people with performance anxiety who are not particularly highly sensitive because from my reading as a psychologist, it's very prevalent. It's the, it's the greatest fear for everybody, yeah. especially live performance. So we all have to deal with it. I was going to mention one other thing about sensitive people, and that is what we call differential susceptibility. Because they're taking in their environment, when they're in a bad environment, they do worse. And when they're in a good environment, they do better, which is very important for where you go to graduate school, who's your instructor. Uh, I think it's important for orchestras too, and, and you know, ensembles that uh, in a positive environment, we just blossom, especially when there's lots of praise and noticing of what we did well. If we're in an environment where there's nothing but criticism, which is, we can say it's a ranking environment, really. You just went down in my estimation because you did that wrong. You know, you're really good, which sounds nice, but if it's, if it has, if it's said in a comparison way, then you can feel afraid that you're about to go down again if you do something wrong. So that now, the troubling thing, but not insoluble, is that people who've had really difficult childhoods at home or in school tend to be more depressed and anxious and shy and possibly then with more performance anxiety than people who've had really wonderful childhoods where maybe they've been encouraged everything they ever did was was praised and so they just go out into the world with a lot of confidence it's not insolvable at all um, um, but it does often take some work in therapy or something like that i don't want to put a big emphasis on it because uh, it is it is solvable, but if you're working on performance anxiety and you know that you have a self-esteem issue that's broader than just in your performance area, or that you don't hear praise even when it's given to you, then you may have to work on on something deeper. And I know you've been reading The Undervalued Self, which is my one book that's not about highly sensitive people. Yeah, wait, and I we, tried to... we need to show it. Here it is. My, my okay. own personal copy. I've been devouring it. Really fantastic stuff. It's, it's a hard book, isn't it? I mean, it, it's... Not, it's... Not for the faint of heart, for sure. Right. <laughs> I tried to give away everything I know about depth therapy, because a lot of therapy these days is cognitive behavioral, and it's, it kind of works on the surface, which I believe in, and I actually teach some of that in the book too but if you if you're stuck still and you're still not able to do what you want to do then you have to go and look deeper yeah at the risk of confusing everybody listening to this i just i just want to quickly talk about the the two principles of linking and ranking that you mentioned in this book because i think that both the reason why i was I wanted to talk to you so much about is because I think both paradigms of the HSP, the highly sensitive person, were mind blowing to me. Suddenly understanding that a lot of my my personal reactions and, and reactions from students that I've seen 
can so directly be connected to the fact that we're being overstimulated and not necessarily uh, being in an anxiety or fear mode. Um, and the paradigm that you offer in the added value itself with the linking and ranking, I thought was so also so fundamental to us understanding what we do on stage. Um, and if I may, I think the idea of linking is that we make a connection between two people, between two individuals. We, we show empathy, we show kindness, we show all these wonderful things that as humanity we're supposed to show to one another. And ranking being another very uh, basic quality where we put things in relationship to one another. Uh, you know, you put our, we put our parents in relationship to us, we put our siblings, we put everything around us in relationship to understand the environment. And the problem starts when, as artists, we go on stage and we are stuck in a ranking mode where the audience is obviously more important than us and what they think of us is more important than what we're creating. And we're not in a linking mode where what we're trying to do is communicate emotion, communicate the content of the piece to the audience and linking with everybody via, you know, the, the actual act of creating. So I guess now that we know what we're talking about, we have the terminology set. Um, what do we want? Where do we want to go from here? Do we want to go about, talk about tips for HSPs? Well, I thought it might not hurt to hear a little bit about for them to hear about your performance anxiety and mine, the history of it, because I think it gives a more um, appreciation of our tips if we if we've done anything with it. <laughs> I'm ready to let you go first. <laughs> okay. Well, I was telling you that when I had such a fear of public speaking when I was a kid, and I remember being in a leadership class in seventh grade, we all had to give a five minute talk, and I was just horrified with fear. And we had to do it anyway. Um, I was saying too that although I wanted to get uh, my PhD later on, I had such a fear of two things. One was the crazy mental hospital in Toronto where I was, it was one of those old, old dark places that I had to do my internship in. But the greater fear was of the defense, the, the dissertation defense, where you're sitting in front of three or four people who are basically deciding whether or not you deserve a doctorate. Yeah. And I just couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I would choke, as they say. And so, uh, but then along came this high sensitivity thing. And I never planned to do any public speaking. The, the first article about it was in a local newspaper. I didn't I didn't intend for it to get out into the world at all. I was just interviewing thing, people because I was curious about this idea of sensitivity, but it appeared in the newspaper. And uh, so many people wanted to hear me talk about it that I agreed to do a talk at the public library. The library was so filled that they had to turn people away. People were in line down the streets. I mean, then this was an auditorium in the public library. It was not. so. I mean, right away, I realized they didn't care about me. They cared about what I was saying. And as long as I'm speaking to highly sensitive people, that's, that's really what has carried me. But also, there are a lot of things that, that can disturb that. So sometimes I have said when I was giving a seminar, in fact, the first seminar I gave on the undervalued self, I felt very uncomfortable because the material was new to me. And I and I apologized that I was stumbling around so much. And I, and I, I tend to say, I'll get better when I'm less over aroused. <laughs> and, that, and that I have done that a number of times, but I don't do it anymore because it's not really an issue. But the dissertation defense, back to that story, is that I did eventually get my doctorate and in a place where the dissertation defense was not a scary thing, but I was still scared of it. So, I did a whole bunch of things to get through it, and, and we'll go to those when we get to the tips. Right. But I have, I mean, one thing to realize is that anybody can get over performance anxiety. I swear by that. I agree. I swear by it. It's just a matter of time more than anything else and deconditioning. It can feel... And information. Mm -hmm. and information. I think my, my piece, the, the one thing I want to add to this is that I think a lot of... I, I can give so many examples of, you know, how, you know, performance anxiety really um, hurt my, my playing and hurt the opportunities that I took, but it always boils down to, there's a piece of information I was missing. Maybe the piece of information was 
how to move my hands better in a way that the hands don't lock because sometimes the fear is so um, overwhelming that your body starts reacting in really bizarre ways. Till, the, till this day, my hands get very cold when I perform and you know, you get used to it because that's the symptom of my MPA, of musicians performing anxiety. They get cold. I'm going to deal with it. It's fine. It's normal because that's what happens on stage. Um, to me, a big, um, a big piece of it was understanding that as long as my mind is focused on a story or an emotion or something that I'm trying to actively put into the music, I'm fine. It's, it's the second that my mind goes to the environment and what are people thinking and you know what the lighting is doing, the second that my brain goes out of what it is that I'm trying to create, then it hits. So just figuring out that I needed a scenario, I needed an image, I needed a picture, I needed to pull from my own emotional experience, match them with the music in, um, in an appropriate way. And that's my dissertation topic, how to match uh, the content of the music with your emotional experience. That the second that that link happened, voila, there's no more fear because you're doing something and you're doing something that involves your emotions rather than trying to suppress them and hold them back. Um, and I think that, yeah, that for me was the big, um, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's so different from public speaking because I mean, I'm focused on what I'm saying totally, but I'm also watching the audience to be sure that they're hearing what I'm saying. And then I get a lot of positive feedback because I can tell that they're liking it. And you, you don't get that from your audience. You, we get it with the clapping. Clapping is a yes. good thing. It's too late, playing, playing on Zoom is not so much fun, but when you're interacting with them, it's fun. Um, but I think just to, to look back to the linking and ranking, I think that the, the really important thing is if we go on stage with the idea of linking with the music and the composer and the instrument and also linking with the audience um, by telling them a story, by sharing the music. And again, there's so many different ways of doing it. It's not just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm uh, telling them a story. It could be through a, through a color or through a, just anything that you're trying to transmit to them. If your brain is on that, if your being is on that, then you're, according to your terminology, we just moved from ranking to linking. We're attempting to link. Yes. If somebody out there is going to link with it, maybe not everybody, but some of them will. Mm -hmm. If our brain is in, I'm going to go out there to show what I can do and to <laughs> rank higher and to get a standing ovation, yes. to, then, then I, I, you're screwed because then you're, you're out of the moment. You're out of, I, for me, it's sort of you, you left your, uh, your job at right. home. This is not no longer what you're here to do. Yes, and that and that is true for public speaking too. For any performance, I think, is that your attention has to be on what you are saying, what you are doing, not on you know. Certainly, if I start noticing if somebody gets up and leaves while I'm speaking, it just blows me. You know, it's like I I I lose my train of thought because. Remember, they all have to go to the bathroom at some point. That really helps. <laughs> it does help, but it's uh, it's still yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I'll call a break for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think maybe we can go more into the tips. I think you've given your your major one, but you did say, and I think it's it's good for everybody, sensitive or not to realize that overstimulation is such a big part of performing and that anxiety and overstimulation are so easily confused. Mm. Now, let, me, let me tell you a, a story if I can do it quickly because I think it's so wonderful. A friend of mine, Phil Zimbardo, who's quite well known for his Stanford prison experiment, um, also studies shyness. And when we met, we had quite a tussle over are they shy or are they highly sensitive? But he did this wonderful, study and he started sending you know he started referring he's on the cover of my book as you know in a blur because he he got it but he did a study where he had women who stanford students who identified as shy and those who did not were put into a situation where they were having a conversation with a handsome guy and he was always the same so what he did was always the same there was also a group who were not shy so and he did not know which was which now the second two conditions so there were four conditions was that there was a, a a loud buzz going on and some of them were told that this noise produced a uh, physical um sensations like sweaty palms and your heart might, might pound and you might feel a little confused but just just go ahead anyway 
and the others didn't get that sound. And, or they didn't get that explanation for the sound. They didn't get the explanation for the sound. So afterwards, those, those shy women who had the explanation for their anxiety as being having to do with the sound were not shy. They had a wonderful time with the guy and the guy really liked them. And uh, so they had another label for the physical sensations they were having. And to some degree, maybe it doesn't matter whether the overstimulation is coming from inside, which is our anxiety, or from outside, but we can certainly do a lot to control the overstimulation from outside. Overstimulation is basically most of the time, I think all the time, is unfamiliarity. We're, we're, we're trying to process something that's new to us. So my recommendation, I don't know, is if you can go to the place where you're going to perform the day before, or, or hopefully it's a place you have performed before, wear the same clothes, go at the same time of day, make it all as I, so that there's nothing extra that's overstimulating. Like if you're worrying about whether your clothes quite fit right because you've never worn this dress or this tuxedo before, that's going to be very distracting. And as you said, your hands are not overstimulating for you anymore because they're familiar. You now know this is just you, but at first it was probably, oh, I, I can't play, my hands are I, stiff and cold. Yeah, so information, very important. Um, I really think people who have performance anxiety have to over-prepare. They just have to over-prepare until it's over. You don't have to do that forever, but you have to feel like you could do it in your sleep because you, with anxiety or over-arousal, your mind doesn't work as well when you pass the the optimal level of arousal. It, it just doesn't work as well. And you just have to accept that that's going to happen. And again, you have the understanding that this is because I'm doing something that's still new to me. And the new part is the audience. But have people there if you if you can while you're practicing. The more the, more the better. Uh, my friend who's the violist, um, I think I'm going to start to cough. <laughs> you take everybody take a drink break right <laughs> good <laughs> she um she doesn't do it because of performance anxiety it's more because it's the point in her career where she wants to do it she plays for hospice then she has a group of people who play for hospice and boy those people are appreciative so if you can go somewhere you can't move a piano, but um, there might be a, a senior home or a memory care center where you could play and just really get in touch with your playing and not with worrying about whether you're, and mainly to get the familiarity of being in front of an audience. And yeah, I, I think for a public speaker, you have to um, you have to imagine and get the sense that the audience cares about you and wants to hear what you have to say. And sometimes it's good to have a friend there that you can look at, or you'll find a person in the audience who seems to be getting what you're saying and liking it. But the other thing that, that I think can work and that you're saying is really what a musician needs to do is to go inside, go inside and operate from there. So, I mean, if you were asked to describe the difference between overstimulation and anxiety, do you feel that you have you have a way of distinguishing between the two? Do you feel that the Usually lot of people, are people who are anxious, most of the time we fear things that have already happened to us. <laughs> right. So there's been some trauma. And unfortunately, with overstimulation, we've usually had it experience. And then what happens is we then are more anxious the next time, do worse, then are more anxious the next time, do worse. I call it the slide into shy, but it's the slide into anxiety. So, but if you can look back and see where it started, you may be able to nail it that way. Go back to the original anxiety and see what happened and that it's not happening anymore or that you could make it not happen anymore by not putting yourself, I always say with like with children, sensitive children, but all children, put them into situations where they'll succeed. So don't perform in a situation where you won't succeed. Don't play something that you won't play well and don't play in front of people who are extremely critical. So build on success. 
Now, if you're stuck with having to build on a failure, you're going to have to go back to square one, I think, and start building on successes again to get rid of the anxiety. You see, I, have, I mean, <clears throat> the way I see it is that I think that, um, if I can say it succinctly, but when we go on stage, there's so many variables at play from, for us as pianists, we don't even know the instrument sometimes. We may be right. an hour before you, you know, you've been working for weeks, but then the instrument is completely different and it's responding to you in a completely different way. So there is that, right. there's the, the whole, the space that you're in and the lighting in that space and the temperature in that space. Then is, of course, I mean, if we're really sensitive, there's the vibe of the place. And like you said, you know, if it's a supportive environment or a not supportive environment, and I can keep on going. There's, of course, the piece itself and all the issues that the piece um, um, is mm -hmm. arousing in us and we have to deal with. So to me, it's almost like we're starting from a place that even a non-sensitive person would be, I'm overstimulated. There's a lot to take in. But the attitude oh. is, is very different for HSPs than the non-HSPs, yeah. right? For the mm -hmm. HSPs, we would be like, this is too much, this is a lot, I can't do it. And for somebody who is not that sensitive or not as affected by it would be like, yeah, it's different, but you know, I'm just going to go with the flow. Right, but you know, really, are there none of those variables that you could not get? Like, can you go on stage an hour before and play on that piano or? All of them. I mean, this is, I think everything that you're saying is stuff that you've, you've been talking about in, in, in the course that I've been teaching. I call it um, run-throughs, the exposure, exposure therapies, run-throughs, you set as many run-throughs as you need. You start with just to your video camera, then you add a friend, then you add two friends, then maybe your teacher, maybe your studio. And for me, the analogy is with stairs. It's to take one small step at a time. So when you get to the performance, you've taken the steps and it's not overwhelming anymore. Right. Um, visualization, yeah, visualization, like imagining yourself in that space, doing well, this is something that, of course, you know, uh, sports therapists talk about all the time. You have to see yourself doing well in order to actually create the experience in reality. And what a lot of the kids in the class reported back is that even in their imagination, even as they were visualizing, they would feel the anxiousness or the overstimulation bubbling up, but they now taught their body that it's something that they can handle, which I think is really the, the pivotal well, that, that brings me back to the other thing that I did, which I think for sensitive people, especially their imaginations will go to the worst possible scenario. Right. So I'm not sure it helps to tell people not to think of those things. Uh, what I did for my dissertation was I, I thought of the worst possible thing that could happen. And I think it was that someone would stand up and say, this is the worst dissertation I've ever heard. And say, I'm going to throw up and then leave the room. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I imagine, so what would you do if you, if you made a serious mistake? I saw Elizabeth Lumensock, who's a wonderful Baroque violinist, break, a, break her, one of her strings. And she wow. just, or it was a bow, uh, she just fixed it and, and started again. Now, I mean, that's not her fault, but I, I would imagine it'd be very hard to stop and start again if the, first, if the first minute was wrong. But you said when we were talking before that if you make a mistake, you can also just kind of cover it up and go on. And, right. and one, another thing I did with my dissertation was to tell myself three things would go wrong. <laughs> And perhaps while you're playing, you can say, oh, okay, yeah, that's the first one. That's the second one you know, right. because of your over arousal. And, and so to be familiar even with mistakes. Well, again, it's, it's I mean, it's <laughs> ranking right here. It's perfectionism. It's the idea that, you know, if it wasn't exactly right or even exactly the way that we imagine it, then we're already failing. We're already doing badly. So if, right. if you prepare from the beginning to say, you know, it, it's not going to be perfect. There are going to be mistakes. But the, I mean, for me, what we have to really focus on is the bigger picture here. Am I communicating anything to you? Am I bringing anything of myself of what I've prepared to the table? Of course, it's not going to be perfect. But as long as we're, you know, for me, it's in sync with the piece. If the piece is very tragic or the piece is very loving, am I communicating that? Am I feeling it? Am I bringing that to the surface? And as long as I'm doing that, who cares about the mistakes? Rubinstein used to improvise in the middle of pieces. I mean, I, I, the examples, I mean, everybody listening to this probably know examples. It's not about the mistakes, it's about the art. And if we focus on the mistakes, then where's the art? Um, that but, is just beautifully, beautifully said, I think. Yeah. That's, just, that's just so profound uh, because... 
what are you doing it for? You know, maybe that you go back to that. What are you doing it for? To have those moments of transcendence and that self-transcendence and uh, even even of you know of the instrument, it's it's taking the composer's work, it's really the music, taking the composer's work and taking it somewhere even the composer may not have known was possible. It's it's a moment of pure transcendence that you that and the only way to get that is to go inside yourself and pull that out and put that into it without thinking about other people. And it's, you're giving to them by not thinking about them in, in it. Right, right. And that's, what, that's again, that's where I love the terminology of ranking and linking. First, I love the fact that both are valid and both are necessary, because I think that's, right. that's imperative to understand. But then the way that we are obsessed with ranking, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, back in Mozart time, he was obsessed with ranking too, but there's something about social media and, and the 21st century and the fact that we are constantly observing what everybody around us is doing and constantly comparing um, our, our, you know, our achievements that is making going on stage every time to be such a, um, a memorandum on our like, maybe undervalued self or maybe overvalued self, but it's always a memorandum on where, where we're stacking up in comparison to everybody else. Instead of and, and I think this is also a fault in the education system that we're a part of that. And I know that a lot of the kids, when we talk about jury time, that's the thing that they keep mentioning. It's, it doesn't feel like a performance. It feels like a test. I'm like, we're testing artists. I mean, there's, there's a paradox where it really should be that they're going on stage to share music, not that they're being, you know, going into this ranking test. It's not about the ranking. It's about what you've created. Now, we have to have the ranking. We have to have ways of giving feedback and, you know, supportive criticism and um, so, so people improve and they learn from their mistakes. But at the same time, how can we amp up the linking quotient right. of this equation so it stops being about, oh my God, I'm a loser because I got an A minus in the test. I mean, there, it's just, it's ridiculous. Yes, you said it very well. Uh, I, call, I call teaching ranking in the service of linking because you're hoping to bring the person up to, to the same level as yourself. Uh, right. and, if, and, and that's, that's a whole different reason for ranking. And I have people do this little exercise where they list the people they'd like to be around and the people they don't like to be around. And the people they wanna be around are the people that they link with, the people that they don't enjoy being around. There's ranking. And even in friendship, you can feel a lot of ranking where someone's constantly comparing or saying, you're my best friend, or I'll never be as good as you are. And it's, it's a, a drag to have that kind of thing brought up. And I would guess that if you could, if there was something where audiences did rank musicians, I'll bet you that the ones that are linking with themselves and with the audience are the ones that they like best. I, I just maybe superficially people would enjoy the people who are put on a good show. But I think if you, if you're really connecting to what's going on, that, that, that linking would come out. Now, maybe what we're, what we're wanting to say here is that maybe you and the music, musicians, musicians you're teaching and maybe sensitive musicians, maybe this is a place where linking can really, we can bring more of it into the world and, and make that, you know, who's gonna love you more than an audience watching you make a slight mistake and just go on. Right, I mean, right, <laughs> right, absolutely. Now they can identify with you. you I, think, I think this is why, you know, we, in the book you talked about, you give these acronym of seek, seek and give in ways of switching from the ranking modality to the linking modality. And I'm, I kept thinking, how can we introduce that to musicians? And to me, if we're going on stage with, again, I'm using the word story, but please, you know, there, there are many other ways of doing it. But if we go on stage with what it is that we're trying to express and we have a clear vision, a clear visual or, you know, feeling of what it is that we're trying to do there, then we're going to link with the audience. We're going to switch it from this, you know, what are they thinking about me to, to actually communicating. Um, but if we don't come, it's almost like if we come armed to the situation, we're going to do well. But if we come as a tabula rasa, if we just show up there and hope for the best, then the ranking is going to take over. And I mean, it's just, it's human nature, isn't it? 
I think so, because the person on stage is supposed to rank higher, right? And then they have to prove that. And I always say one of the problems with ranking is you've got to stay on top. <laughs> you know, if you get to the top, then all you do is worry about somebody getting and pulling you down. So, and I've been in situations where I have felt that somebody with a sort of a narcissistic intention wanted to pull me down, wanted me to look bad. And so definitely there's a way in which we can stimulate linking or stimulate ranking just by who we are and how we behave. And I think, you know, you see that in, in sports, like there are certain people who you know that they've got to win, they want to win, but their sportsmanship just stands out, the way they are generous and the way they handle failure. And, and I think that certainly comes across with musicians when they come on stage. And I can certainly, <laughs> I certainly know um, when I see ranking and when I see linking in a performer and the way they behave. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So Congrats. maybe it's a good, a good segue to talk about when, I guess, when, when the two meet together, maybe as, you know, we, we're talking about in terms of artists and audience members, but we can also talk about it in terms of teacher and student or in terms of, of colleagues collaborating when, when we, let's, let's take it first to the HSP um, world, when somebody who is highly sensitive meets somebody who is non-highly sensitive and we, they start talking and what happens? <laughs> Yeah. Well, listening is the key and sensitive people, if they're not overstimulated are good listeners, when they're overstimulated, they're not good listeners, right? So maybe a calmness is important in, on both sides. I'm, I'm an avid meditator. I've been meditating for over 50 years, most of the time, an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And, and, and I really think it helps to establish a kind of equanimity inside, which then makes it possible to, to accept when people come at you in a ranking way, if you don't rank back, it's sort of shocking to them. Sometimes they see it as weak, but sometimes if you just say, I, I like that guy Rosenthal's nonviolent communication where you just for a while, you just go, hmm, that's really interesting. You feel that way. You must have had some very bad experiences with people like that, but you feel so strongly that way. <laughs> this is great. I love it. Yeah, he's wonderful. You, you should definitely get, uh, get a hold of him. And then, and then eventually you realize that there are only certain basic human needs, and one of them is to feel respected, which means not to be ranked low. And there's physical security and a few things like that and a feeling understood. And then you establish what is the need that's behind this person's <coughs> behavior that you want to change. <laughs> right. And so I think sometimes we run into critics, maybe audiences, I don't know, that are in a kind of a complex where they, where they have to rank you low those are situations you don't want to be in you know you have to be maybe i like what you're saying maybe the attitude to begin with should be sort of this equanimity where you're you're hearing what's coming at you but you're not taking it personally i, I can't tell you about some of the, the the stupid things that people say after concerts to you like oh i really you, rubinstein's performance was more convincing i mean, think <laughs> i know he's he's definitely better than i am um, so it's it's um <laughs> You really have to put on a face of like, mm, that's interesting. Um, but I'm thinking more in terms of, I don't know how to say it exactly, but I think a lot of the problem comes from uh, the way I see it. I'm, I'm tall, I'm 6'3". And, you know, when people tell me, oh, it's going to be very comfortable to sit, to sit on an international flight, I go like, no, it's not going to be because my knees are going to be banging into the seat in front of me or the subway, I have to watch my head or there's a ceiling fan, I have to watch my head. What works for one person is not necessarily going to work for another person. And right. especially when it comes to, to going on stage, um, and I think you make beautiful points for that in the book, that knowing that you're an HSP and you're going to be sensitive to certain things, and even though the people around you are not picking up on those um, on those things, you, you really need to stay true to yourself. Go like, yes, the light is really affecting me badly right now. What can I do about it? 
um, or you know, if we can change the microphones, or if we can change the positions of the instruments on stage, or if we can do anything to make the situation, makes the stimuli, whatever it is, change it so you're you're more comfortable with it, um, and not just have to constantly agree with everything that is being said around you just because oh. of the majority uh, opinion. Oh, that's so true. That's so true, and that's that's where you you have to take i mean we have our five to thrive the first one of the five things that highly sensitive people need to to do is to believe their trait is real and to accept it and to know there's lots of other people that have the trait and therefore their needs may be different okay if i feel pain more than other people do then um, i'm going to need to be you know that's going to have to be a factor in my treatment in a doctor's office or something like that right and then there's how you talk to people about it and that's that varies with the situation but i always say since the people come into the world with soft boundaries you know kind of thin boundaries we're taking in the environment we're taking in other people's needs so we have to learn how to set firm boundaries and and to be able to say after a performance if people want you to go out to dinner or something like that if, if that's not going to work for you you just have to say that you know that's that you know, that's not going to work for me. And, and I don't even I would recommend that, not saying why even, because then they'll, you know, say, well, I have to catch an early flight. Well, I'll bet I can get you on a later flight. And then we, <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's not, <laughs> it's not going to work for me, period. It's actually, that reminds me of a funny story. We were on tour and my, my friend decided he needed to take me out partying and clubbing with him. And after five minutes in that place where I couldn't hear anybody speaking, I was so uncomfortable. I said, dude, I'm going to go across the street. Barnes & Noble is right there. I'm going to be in there. You come find it when you're done clubbing. <laughs> and that was, I mean, mercifully, it was still open. So that was the solution. But you just have to do what feels right and comfortable for you and not feel, you know, that you have to prove anything to anyone. Yes. And... Uh... I think it's important for sensitive people to make that just a part of their lifestyle and to plan ahead and to see when something like that is coming and to be sure that, you know, I've thought about you on a tour and I thought, oh boy, that could be really, really hard on him if he doesn't plan it well, because it's just overstimulation after overstimulation performing gets you tired after a while. And I, I know I, I just didn't factor that in enough in my early stage with the book and they would have me going to you know book signings up and down the west coast you know just hop on a plane and now go to seattle and then <laughs> it was just it was hard for me to say no they had this radio station tour where you sit at home and you get onto the radio do an interview at that time zone and you work your way all the way across the country till very very late at night and you're still sitting there you can't even remember whether you said this before or not because you know you said it before but did you say it in this situation and those things really really wore me out and even though i was highly sensitive it was hard for me to say no and it, because i was highly sensitive and i and i so in planning yeah, that's it i think that's a really that, that's the, the in the, the crux one of the things in the crux of it is that we we live with the majority of people who don't have that yeah. reaction to think so the second that we say we have that reaction people sort of raise their eyebrow and go what's yes. wrong with you and you just have to say you know i'm six three i'm taller than you so i need different size clothing than you and you just need to accept that but especially with with younger um with younger students you feel their you feel their reluctance i see it all the time they go on stage and they are not going to take a second to shift the stand just so they can see better they're so terrified of what they're about to do they are not going to adjust the environment to help them do better or adjust the, the height of the bench or just take a well, second to breathe yeah out. that's a lot of your work to give them permission i i noticed that sensitive people tend to go along with the environment up until around age 30. For one thing, when you're younger, you can tolerate more, but then at a certain point, they stop conforming to their peers and they stop conforming to the rest of the world. And they start realizing that they have to make themselves more comfortable, but they can do that earlier if they're really told that that's important. So that's, 
yeah, it's um, giving yourself permission to be yourself. And because the majority of people are not highly sensitive, we all seem to assume that other people are going to be like ourselves. But like we have to turn up the volume in a sense to the level that they'll hear. Like if we if we sort of hint, gee, this lighting is unusually bright. Do you usually have it this way? That that would get through to another highly sensitive person, but it's not going to get through to a lot of people. You have to say, I need the lighting adjusted. And we we do this with horses. We take we take people out with with horses and put the horse at the other end of the line, and you have to communicate that you want them to go back. And you do it with your finger. You can do it with your wrist. You can do it with your and then you have to, sometimes you have to do like this. So we we teach um, suggest, ask, tell, demand, and moving moving up to where you get the reaction you want from the horse. And the horse horse has been through this many times, but they're usually testing the person. And what's interesting to hear is is the sense that people say, "I didn't want to hurt the horse. I didn't want the horse to not like me. I didn't want to bother him." Well, these are the things. Then we have them imagine somebody in their life who crosses their boundaries all the time. <laughs> and then we say, okay, what's the problem here that you can't make this, this person step back from you when you want them to? Mm. So being able to set boundaries and reinforce them, very important because, yes, most people who are not as sensitive don't understand it. And we can explain it depending on the situation. Oh. I think often uh, it, it helps to tag it onto something positive. Well, I think you invited me here because you really like how I play. And how I play is very affected by A, B, and C. Right. If you want the best out of me, <laughs> do this not that i think it has to start even sooner it has to start with the way that we as educators as teachers we give permission to the students to to articulate what it is that they're experiencing what is in the environment causing them um, a discomfort what what can we do to help them um, feel more at ease and i know i mean i'm guilty and it is everybody else. I know what my sensitivities are, and I will, of course, be paying more attention to those. But it could be that I'm totally missing a student who is having, you know, being totally overstimulated by something. I'm completely missing it. Um, so it's it's it, it's really it's a two way street. We have to we have to listen, and we also have to ask the <clears throat> as if to use the emotion. <laughs> Turn up the volume until the overstimulated teacher finally hears you. <laughs> but you sound like a wonderful, wonderful teacher. I'm I'm glad you're teaching and not just performing because you have a lot to give. Thank you. I appreciate it. A lot to give. I'm wondering, there was one piece here. I don't know if we maybe, you know, we can I can edit it out later, but the idea of something that I talk about in the class is this uh, paradox between or conundrum between being sensitive on the inside and being tough skin on the outside as musicians we we're constantly taught you know you have to develop a tough skin for rejection and you know take the criticism and sort of building this tough exterior and at the same time if you know if people listening agree that on the inside we're supposed to be very sensitive we're supposed to be sensitive to the music to the phrasing to the harmonic transitions how do we reconcile the two is there a way to reconcile the two or is it sort of, you know, it is what it is. We just have to figure out what our own boundaries are. Well, I think it depends on how much you can protect yourself from that stuff. Like, I have an assistant who, I never see negative things. <laughs> I don't go on social media. I don't know what people say about me. I don't care. You know, so, so that's one way. I know Alanis Morissette has somebody who, protects her from a lot of really horrible things that people say about her. You know, it's not a total uh, total job, but it, it, each one of those is kind of a blow and we process it more because we process things deeply. We process those negative things more. So there's a whole art to not taking things too personally. You know, you have to look at where the other person is coming from. What, what do they really know about the subject? Um, you know, what is their motivation? What kind of rank, ranking thing do they have going on? There's a lot of things we can do. I don't think thick skin is the answer because that's too too general. 
Yeah. You see, to me, I always thought it was a canon because I can either be sensitive or not. I can't be sensitive, you know, activate and disactivate. It just doesn't work that way. And yeah. if I know that and I take my sensitivity wherever I go, then I'm, I'm going to know that I'm going to have to, you know, be careful in certain interactions or, um, yeah, I, I guess I, 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 there was one performance that I gave that the, the reviewer completely shredded me to pieces. But mercifully, the universe decided I would not get to see that review until the second performance was over. So I was spared. So sometimes you just have to trust your lucky stars to be yes. from it. Yes, and, and maybe not read reviews. Um, I, maybe not read them until it's all over or whatever. I mean, because, you know, you know, reviewers have all kinds of motivations going on and all kinds of moods and all kinds of prejudices. It's, it's a shame to have someone judged and they're affected emotionally by something that can be very arbitrary. So maybe a lot of it would be developing an attitude and discussing, I'm sure you do discuss it in the class, but discuss it with other musicians, how they protect themselves from those kinds of really, really sensitive people take feedback much more deeply. We're much more affected by it. Right. And I, I mean, we talk a lot about the difference between negativity and constructive criticism and how to sort of take the content without, you know, without the venom. But if somebody said, oh, you know, measure three, you missed. Go, OK, let's take the venom out of that statement. What happened in measure three? Did something happen in measure right. three? Is that making stuff up? Um, but this idea of taking the content and started separating it into yes. what's actually there, I think that's that it's tricky. It's tricky to do. Um, I yes, I always say as a as a writer, I I someone I ask for comments and I get a lot of criticism and I give it 24 hours. I try not to get defensive, you know, I try to wait and then yes, begin to say, gee, maybe I should rewrite that whole section. But you don't want to do that right away either because you're you're reacting. So give it 24 hours and you may toss it out, you may take 20%, you may it's it, but sorting it out means letting those emotions settle down, which are natural. And defensiveness is natural. Less of it, the better. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, another really beautiful point that you make um, in the book is the difference between the incubation period versus the exposure period for, and I'm going to quote, I thought this, this was so good. Uh, much of the suffering of sensitive artists could be prevented by understanding the impact of this alternating of the low stimulation of creative isolation with the increased stimulation of <laughs> exposure. And I thought to me, that was like, oh, that's what's happening. Yes. Oh, sure. Well, it's that incubation that produces all of the beauty. I mean, it's whether you think of it as practice or thinking about the piece or meditating and going inside and going out into nature and all the inspiration, all the stuff that comes out in your playing. Uh, the incubation is the key part and keeping as much of that as possible with you is what you're talking about when you go on stage, is trying to stay in touch with that this, the now they become symbols and images and, and feelings that you want to put into your music. And you just try to stay in that incubation mode or the product of the incubation and keep the stimulation at bay. And, and I, I think it's just a, it's a matter of time and practice. I, I would guess, do you feel that it's improved for you over time? I think, like I said earlier, I think that the thing that really improved it once I realized that what I was going to present on stage is something that is pers personal and meaningful to me, then the whole thing transformed. Yes. As long as it was about playing all the right notes or as long as it was about accuracy, I was, I was off. I would be a total mess because I knew I was not capable of perfection. I was surrounded by pe people who were, you know, Juilliard is a wonderful school. There's incredible level of talent there. And when you're surrounded by that incredible level of talent, you rank yourself accordingly. And I felt that once I figured out that what I had to give to the world was more inside me and not so much about the technical and the perfectionist side of things, I was like, oh, okay, I belong here. 
Um, but that, that took a long time to understand. And more importantly, a long time to figure out how do you actually bring that on stage? Like we started a conversation talking about, you know, she can do it in private, but can she do it on stage? That really is, is the biggest hurdle of them all. Um, and what can we do in order to ensure that that pathway between your inner world is open when you go on stage and suddenly everything becomes, you know, very myopic and very, you know, uh, uh, terrifying at times. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. Well, I think that equanimity, the more that that can be de developed um, in yourself in all situations, then I think that that cultures your nervous system to behave in a certain way in all situations or, or more situations. So I, I think that's, we have to train our nervous system in a sense, train our mind, train our hearts to stay, to stay in that place of peace, even on stage. And that must, you know, takes a lot, long time, takes a lot of good discovery and good teaching. Yeah. Well, okay, um, we're, we're going to wrap it up for that. Maybe we're going to do another one of these conversations to, you know, to, take, to talk about all the things we didn't cover, but I want to thank you for, for joining me. It's been a, a privilege and an honor. Um, and I'll, I'll link more information about you. And if anybody has any questions, they're welcome to write to me and I will post them um, in the future. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. I, I look, looked forward to this. You know why? Because I love your playing. Oh, your you. personality, your everything, your sensitivity comes right through that. And, uh, and so what a privilege for me to, to get to be on stage with you. <laughs>